the prompt to Dr. Hoffer was, we've got a problem. The prompt to me was, we've got some questions. As you heard in the previous briefing, clearly what had happened here is some type of sensory damage and some type of central damage. Was the sensory damage the cause of the central damage? Are these two things unrelated? What types of things we see here and what might be a viable vector for producing these effects? We go to my second slide, we have is otopathology and ototoxicity, and let me define those words to you. Otopathology means damage to the ear. Ototoxicity is some toxic effect to the ear. We're looking at the ear, there's a number of different things that are there. Obviously, we have the cochlea, which is the hearing organ of the ear, but also nestled deep, as Dr. Hopper explained to you, within that same vestibule are the balance organs, semicircular canals, the utriculus, and the saccule, and these are in fact connected. What are the signs and symptoms that you would get with otopathology and or ototoxicity? You've heard some of them already. Hearing loss or changes in the ability to hear, ringing in the ear, tinnitus, vertigo and disequilibrium, with nausea, visual features such as you had problems with saccades, nystagmus, oscillopsia, Headache could be gradual, sudden, might be one-sided or two-sided, can be temporary, could be durable. Next slide, please. If you then go to possible vectors to induce these effects, a number of things could do it. Drugs could do it. Devices could do it. Of the drugs that could do this, the short list is antibiotics, loop diuretics, drugs that are used for certain forms of chemotherapy like cisplatin and carboplatin, high doses of salicylates, that's aspirin, certain heavy metals, most notably mercury and lead, organic solvents. Might technology also be able to do it? Yes, absolutely. We know that subsonic stimulation below 20 hertz can certainly do something like this, but realistically, that's very, very difficult to be able to propagate. Ultrasonic stimulation in around the range of 4,000 hertz, uh, 4,500 hertz, could certainly do this type of thing, as could electromagnetic pulse stimulation uh, along the same frequency might be microwave stimulation. What would the pathology be if you saw this? My background is as a neurotoxicologist and neuropathologist. A number of things. You see inflammation in and around the inner ear, the damage to the hair cells, both of the cochlea as well as the otolithic organs, the utricular saccule. You'd see membrane scarring as a consequence of this, and you'd see neurologic damage. The idea of engaging the nerves in such a heavy way would then get what's called excitotoxic postsynaptic effects, where now what you're doing is you're literally overblasting the nerves, and overblasting the nerves, you're then causing a change in their calcium metabolism. This would then cause something called excitotoxicity. We go to the next slide. Let me show you what we're talking about here. We're talking about the organs of the inner ear. We see here the external the ear canal, the, what's called the auditory hiatus. This is on the upper left. And we can see the organ of hearing, called the cochlea. And then around the organ of hearing, the cochlea, you see what look like loops. If we then take this down a little bit, we know that those are the areas that are dealing with balance. And there are essentially two main areas, one that is dealing with rotational balance. These are semicircular canals. And the other, which is positional balance with regard to being upright. That is the utriculus and the saccule. What's interesting to note, and that you'll hear further from in Dr. Balaban's lecture, is that high-frequency stimulation would then overstimulate the base of the cochlea. The cochlea is what we call tonotopically tuned. In other words, the relative stiffness of the membrane of the cochlea responds to different wavelengths of sound, displacement of sound that would then cause fluid movement inside the cochlea. High frequency displaces, most notably, the base of the cochlea, and the base of the cochlea intersects with the vestibule, the area that also deals with the upright positional balance. But if we then take a look at what types of things might induce some of the neuropathological or neurocognitive changes, well, now we have to go back and take a look at perhaps damage to the balance organ. Certainly these individuals heard something, they had some problems with regard to hearing ringing in the ears, but they were profoundly affected by balance issues, vertiginous defect, vertigo. Well, what types of things could, in fact, do this? Is it possible that just damage to the inner ear could induce cognitive changes? Yes, absolutely. As Dr. Hoffer so eloquently put, the idea of having to work pretty hard to keep yourself in the upright when you have positional disturbances and when you're having a hard time being to maintain what is upright and what is not and the room is spinning can be not only disorienting, it can be cognitively dysfunctional. We had some training with pilots where we demonstrated putting people in a device that is referred to characteristically as a spin and puke and having them do a particular set of cognitive tasks becomes exceedingly difficult, not only when they're spinning, but also when they're tumbling with regard to their upright position. So we know that cognitive overload can occur as a consequence of positional reestablishment. Could we just be seeing an artifact of damage to the inner ear that then induces these cognitive signs and symptoms? Well, yes, could, but there may be something more to this. There may actually be damage more centrally. There may be damages then communicated to the brain. Well, how could that be? Could drugs do it? Yep, certainly some of the drugs that we see that may also have ototoxic effect, most notably heavy metals like mercury and lead, certain organic solvents, could certainly then induce a central nervous system pathology as well. 
What about the technologies that would induce these otopathologic effects? Could they also have some effect on the central nervous system? Yes, they could. And there is, in fact, a literature to suggest that sonic generators, uh, electromagnetic pulse generators, and even things like nanoparticulates could, in fact, be vectored through the ear, through the sinuses, through the eyes, and have centralized effects by virtue of harmonic frequencies that would then disrupt the stabilization of structures and functions of the brain. Well, how might we do this? Let's go to the next slide that says mechanisms of effect. And what I really need you to note here is the functional anatomy. The inner ear is nestled next to, anatomically nestled next to, the intimate lining of the brain and actually communicates with the fluid medium of the brain. A number of different ways this can happen. Obviously, if we're looking at something like an ultrasonic stimulating device or an electromagnetic pulse device, the idea of focused cavitation in fluid media certainly is conducted within the ear. And by making it conducted within the ear, it can then communicate to the brain space. It can communicate to the brain space through a number of different mechanisms. If we take a look at the next slide, one is something called perilymph. Perilymph is the fluid that is the medium of conductance within the inner ear. And we also recognize that the entirety of that inner ear is bathed in this fluid, and that is the fluid medium by which things like balance, positional rotation, as well as hearing media can then be propagated. Obviously, as a fluid that has a particular viscosity, it's then subject to cavitation changes based upon the frequency of the stimulus that's applied to it. And if we take a look at what we might be seeing here with regard to the perilymph, one of the things that becomes very important to note is that the fluid of the inner ear directly communicates with the fluid that bathes the brain. There are two primary mechanisms by which this occurs. The one that would be most notable is something known as the cochlear aqueduct. That we see it here in the upper left-hand portion of the slide talking about mechanisms of effect. This communicates directly with an area of the brain called the subarachnoid space, which is equally bathed in fluid. There's also a lesser aqueduct called a vestibular aqueduct, which is positionally located sort of around the back of that vestibule where the balance organs are. And what's important to note about both of these aqueducts is they create a venturi effect. So in the vestibule, where the balance organs are and where the initiation of the window to the cochlea is, that's a fairly large space, anatomically speaking. I mean, it's actually quite small in, in real terms, but it's a fairly large space. It represents something called a foyer. And if you then induce cavitation changes within that space, and you then communicate the cavitation into a smaller space, you're getting a venturi pipe effect. So you're increasing both the speed and the force by which those bubbles can then travel. Think of taking a large volume of water and funneling it down, literally into a funnel, into a hose. You know that there's an inverse relationship between volume space, diameter, and pressure. So what we're then able to do is communicate this directly up into the brain space. What would happen there? Over on the right, you see what that brain space looks like. That brain space has sort of a, a membranous uh, quality to it, the, the arachnoidal membrane, so-called because arachnoida refers to spiders, and this looks like a spider webby type of membrane with a space, and in that space also were in blood vessels. Is it possible that by communicating bubbles into that space, what you then do is disrupt the space itself and communicate those particular pressure disturbances directly onto the brain tissue? Yes, it is. Is it also possible to communicate that similar form of harmonic frequency to then create reciprocal cavitation within the blood spaces because of the vasculature that exists in the subarachnoid space? Indeed, that is as well. And if you go to the next slide, mechanisms of direct or communicating effects, you can actually see how these effects might then be propagated into the fluid media that surrounds the brain. But wait, there's more. We're talking about the possibility of inducing cavitation in the vasculature, and there's another way that this could happen not just by harmonic communication by virtue of disrupting the subarachnoidal fluid, but also by direct communication into the vascular space. There are a number of blood vessels that provide a perfusion to the inner ear, and we see these in the upper left of this slide talking about focus cavitation of fluid media being blood. The cochlear artery, the vestibular artery, the inferior branch of that are all fed by something called the basilar artery. And the basilar artery then communicates up to the middle cerebral artery, which then launches up into the brain. And one of the dimensions of the cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery, is a bunch of finger-like projections that go into the brain space called lacunar arteries. These are very, very small. Lacunar arteries in the middle cerebral artery also branch out to form what's called medullary arteries. Medullary arteries go into the brain space to then provide perfusion to both gray matter and white matter. But you're getting the same type of effect. What you're getting is a fairly large blood vessel, which then narrows down, narrows down yet again. So you're getting a Venturi type effect to be able to maintain pressure. And as a consequence, you're seeing increased acceleration of cavitation bubbles. And if, in fact, they burst, the disruption is then going to be amplified. How would you assess this type of thing? I'm not going to go back and reiterate what Dr. Hofer talked about before, but this is basically how you do it. If you want to do it more in a detailed way, what you need to do is from some forensic dissective anatomy, a biopsy or necropsy. You could also model this. 
vitro, in vivo, or with what's called CompuSimulacra, in other words, utilizing computational simulacra to be able to identify what would be happening in various phantoms. I'm going to leave that discussion to my colleague, Dr. Balaban, who's actually done this work. So what we engage in is something called abductive forensics. Abductive forensics. In other words, given what you got, what could do it? This gives us the idea of best estimate possibilities, and from that, indices of probability. Is it possible and probable that drugs alone could do this? Highly unlikely. Is it possible and probable that ultrasonics could do this? Yes, it's very possible, and it is probable. Is it possible and probable that electromagnetic pulse devices that would then be propagated either directly or vectored could do this? Yes, it's very, very possible and very probable. What about a combinatory approach? Sonic and or electromagnetic pulse generation, and perhaps even drugs or toxins that could be given as something to increase the disposition to this. It's quite possible, a very strongly positive explanatory value. One other possibility that's looming out there is we might be seeing something else. Now, please, this is very, very tentative and highly putative, and I want to, want to tell you that. But there has been some talk of late, my colleague Diane Deulis, my colleague Jen Snow is on the line, have been engaging in these conversations, that modification of existing microbes may produce signs and symptoms that we heretofore have not seen. Is it possible that there may be some type of otopathologic or neuropathologic microbe that could have been introduced to these individuals? Is it possible? Yes, it is. Is it probable? No, it's not. A number of reasons for that. Certainly, you're not also seeing the constellation of signs and symptoms that you'd see elsewhere in the body. You're not seeing a white cell response that would be indicative of some type of immunological orientation to an introduced microbe. And the same thing is true with drugs. The recovery of various drugs or their metabolites is really not one of the salient features of these patients. So again, that takes us back to the abductive reasoning, which would suggest that this is most likely induced by some device that is ultrasonic, electromagnetic pulse, or some combination. That said, what I'd like to then do is hand the conversation off the next phase of the briefing to my colleague, Dr. Balaban, who's done an awful lot of empirical modeling of this to be able to describe a few more mechanisms and cause. Carrie. 